uh, we cannot hear from Fatin Fateh. You need to unmute my. So, welcome to everyone. I hope you can see my slides in the full screen mode. So first of all, good evening to all. And I hope I, I would like to thank International Center for Climate Change and Development for arranging the South Asia Resilience Hub and uh, allocating a session for Bangladesh Agriculture University under the title of Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation Through Improved Agricultural Practices. And here we have uh, two presentations, one from my side. I am Professor Dr. Joan Gushami, and the title of my presentation is Climate Resilient Agriculture for Food and Nutrition Security. In the monthly webinar, I also presented uh, these uh, topics and also discussed my research findings. So I think those who have attended that meeting, so it will be a bit kind of overlapping. So I hope you will enjoy and you will uh, have many questions or many suggestions after my presentation. So this here is the outline of my presentation. First of all, I will uh, discuss about what is climate change. I think we are all of us know about this and well concerned about these topics. However, I will repeat and I would like to emphasize on the impact of climate change and climate resilient agriculture, technologies for climate resilient agriculture, alternative approaches, like how we can resilient these uh, approaches can handle the impact of climate change or reduce the consequences of climate change and what will be the way forward. Now, what is the climate change? Climate change is actually the shipment or change in the temperature pattern or in the precipitation levels, wind patterns, and other kinds of aspects of the Earth's climate system, which is not usually uh, present or present situation also change. Actually, it is mainly uh, occurred by the uh, different kind of human activities, uh, particularly the greenhouse gas emission, such as carbon dioxide from burning uh, fossil fuels and deforestation. Additionally, some kinds of industries and automobiles also emit the greenhouse gases. Some kind of natural disasters like forest fire, volcanoes, deforestations, and other factors like the population growth. Some kinds of ruminants also emit uh, greenhouse gases, agrochemicals, and land use changes. And also there are other factors which are responsible for climate change. Those are not listed here. Potential effects of climate change. Climate change has a devastating uh, impact on the uh, climates and other factors, including from agriculture to the human health and, and water resources and other resources, natural resources also. We can see that the increase in temperature, increase in precipitation and change in precipitation pattern, rise in sea level causes the different issues like health hazards, some kinds of species and natural areas also uh, impacted by this uh, climate change and water resources like quality of water and sufficient supply of the water also hampered due to the uh, impacts of climate change. And the forest uh, areas also uh, cause, uh, has some impacts, has also uh, uh, facing some problems due to the climate change. Coastal inundation, from the salinity water, saline water, and other kind of uh, natural disaster changing or has some impact on the coastal areas also. And what is the most important that we depend on agriculture for food, nutrition, and other uh, livelihood patterns. So this agriculture sector is the most susceptible and most vulnerable uh, sector under the threat of climate change. Not only the decreasing the crop yields and also the decreasing uh, the uh, uh, demand or increasing the demand of irrigation, decreasing the availability of water, 
all these things factors are all, also in, have some negative impact on the agricultural production and uh, food security so in that case if we check that how the climate change in bangladesh uh, causing the changes uh, in the daily temperature the average temperature rise uh, from 1976 to 2019 we can see that in the central part of this country have the rise of 0.5 degrees celsius whereas in the eastern part in the chittagong and silet division the rise is around 0.9 degrees celsius so changes uh, from the bar graph we can see the changes in the temperature uh, uh, particularly the monthly temperature from 1901 to 2019. During the month of February, the change in uh, temperature is uh, highest, around 1.9 degree. Actually, it is the winter season, but the uh, winter is getting warmer. And during the month of uh, other months, though the temperature rise is uh, not uh, uh, significant, but uh, it is also a rise and it's also prolonging the summer duration. And the monsoon season is very unpredictable nowadays, what who, who we are experiencing. Particularly, the monsoon is uh, uh, in Bangladesh, June to August. And uh, during the monsoon season, there is a remarkable amount of rainfall. But due to the uh, change of climate and uh, the consequences of climate change, the uh, monsoon is go going to be the longer. And it extended from September to October. And the rainfall also that on that particular month, they increasing around 43 millimeters, suggesting a longer monsoon period from March to October. And the rainfall pattern is also erecting. That's why in the last week, we experienced a high amount of uh, rainfall in the, the different parts of Bangladesh, particularly in my mentioning division. And uh, it is not, was not expected. And it was a record uh, amount of the rainfall. In particular case, we can see that uh, in different part of the country, the rainfall uh, from per year, the changes in the rainfall pattern. So it has a, a, a diversified or different kind of, and it is a sometimes it's almost increase and sometimes decrease, but decrease in the winter season, but in the monsoon, it increase. But uh, depending on the location, it's uh, also success in during the monsoon season in the north south part the temp the rainfall amount also increased uh, it, it, it was a remarkable and in the southeast part also it was a very uh, uh, high increase compared to other region during the monsoon season so here is the different part of bangladesh as marked by this uh, southeastern zone or northeastern zone and northeastern part of north region so this is the, the different part, as we can see that uh, this is the eastern part uh, and here is the uh, Bay of Bengal in the south. So this uh, different regions has been and, uh, segmented or uh, separated by this marking. And we can see that uh, the changes in climate change uh, has a different kind of impact on different part of the country. If we consider that the northwest part, the temperature rise and drought, particularly the drought in the northern region, on, um, has a most impacted sector like agriculture sector, water, electricity supply, and health. In case of coastal areas, uh, sea level rise and salinity intrusion affecting all these uh, component uh, of the agriculture, water, human settlement, electricity supply, and other factors. In the central part, actually, uh, floods, particularly uh, flash flood, causes some kind of uh, a hamper on the agricultural sectors and other uh, human settlement also. In the uh, coastal region, the cyclone and storm surge and drainage convection, it also causes the uh, uh, problem for the livelihoods on that particular area, including agriculture sectors. Uh, a climate change not only hamper the uh, human health, but uh, not only hamper the agriculture, and also, also the human health and different kinds of, if it is in the rising in temperature, it uh, can cause the illness of uh, like from heat, extreme heat and uh, severe weather and from extreme weather, air pollution and other kind of changes causes the different diseases like uh, the malaria, dengue. So we can see that, that uh, either, uh, recently we have uh, experienced that uh, dengue prevalence also increased. Maybe there are some 
uh, uh, hidden causes from climate change. I don't know, we need to uh, explore. And other kind of things like water quality and water supply and causes water related diseases. So climate change is um, uh, not um, impacting that our uh, income generation or agriculture sector, but also the human health and even the mental health also and uh, environmental pollution also. So considering all these things, climate change is a, uh, alarming uh, for us and we need to be prepared. And what I discussed that climate change actually am impacting that agricultural sector most because agriculture actually depend on that particular and agriculture has a stolen a particular climate and the particular environment on the soil properties and that uh, water availability, all these things control the agricultural production and man management. But however, due to the change in climate, and that, that impacts on agriculture sector. If we think about the rise in temperature, it hampering the flowering of the plants or the early flowering and accelerated the maturity and poor grain quality and increased irrigation demand. So all these things impact on the plant uh, production. Whereas in case of livestock sector, uh, it also causes the losses in production, increased mortality of the animals morbidity also increased and biodiversity also decreased. So in all these cases, we can see that extreme weather events like soil erosion, loss of arable land and crop failure is also causing here. Ultimately, that cumulative impact on the change in cropping pattern, decline in yield and decrease quality and nutrition security is under threat. And ultimately, we also causing the yield reduction and socioeconomic impact also visible in some part of the country and all over the world, like malnutrition, effect on trade, urban, uh, rural urban migration, and uh, uh, reduced productivity. So all these things are uh, due to the impact of the agriculture by the climate change. So if we see that uh, what the consequences uh, most uh, impacting the agriculture, I major consequences are salinity, drought, and extreme flood. So we know that salinity actually increases soil content of the soil or the water that are used for uh, uh, agricultural land and uh, also arid climate, saline subsoils and inadequate drains, uh, also drainage system also causes the salinity. Particularly in southern part of the Bangladesh, the saline water from the seas uh, also intrusion causes the uh, causing the salinity of that particular inland water body and ultimately causing the increase of salinity of that particular cropping areas. So it is estimated that at least 20% of the irrigated lands are salt affected in the world. If we see, if we uh, that uh, uh, in this uh, graph that we can see that in this figure. Sodium salts like uh, water, it's uh, inundation, infiltration into the cropping field and decrease yield and ecosystem services. And it's also an impact on the drinking water and reduce the productivity because they face some health impacts. All these things causes the economic losses and poverty and who is uh, causes the, uh, which also have a negative spiral and it's also uh, have some con uh, impacts on the uh, next years and next years. So it's uh, impacts on the cyclic order. In case of coastal salinity, around one to 33% in the last uh, 25 years as reported by Rahman et al. in uh, 2018, and around 831 million hectare of agricultural land is salt affected globally, uh, reported by Food and Agricultural Organization. And 50% of the arable land would be salinized by 2050, as expected. This is the scenario of the global uh, area under salinity. And salinity is, uh, in some cases, some regions of the uh, global context. So high evaporation, saline water, low precision, all these things causes the salinity and increase 10% uh, annually to agricultural land. And for that uh, increase in the salinity, about 6% of the cultivated area destroyed by salinization. So salinity, uh, as we uh, mentioned that uh, climate change causes the hampering of the uh, plant physiological uh, growth. Here we can see also that salinity have uh, some particular impacts like morphological, biochemical, uh, productivity and physiological. 
So morphological inhibit inhibit seed product seed germination and the chlorosis or uh, is the early um, uh, it's a kind of uh, unavailability of some nutrients. Leaf senescence, stunted growth, decreased root and root fresh air and dry air. In case of biochemical effects, oxidative stress, electrolyte leakage, reduced carbon fixation, membrane damage, loss of organelles function. In case of crop productivity, we can say that spike sterility, less grain oil, and ultimately low grain yield and harvesting this also low. Physiological effects, that stomatal closure and photosynthesis also inhibits decreased water content, low osmotic potential and nutrient imbalance. So the, all these are these impacts from the cell due to the salinity uh, of the crops. So in Bangladesh, it is also a major problem, and one third of the agricultural land is at, uh, about uh, one third of the agricultural land is under, under the threat of salinity. And according to SRDI, 2.86 million hectares of coastal and offshore lands, and about 1.056 million hectares of arable lands are affected by varying degrees of salinity. About 53% of the coastal region is affected by different degrees of salinity. So if we see that that, uh, that borderline of this uh, coastal region, like uh, Bhola, Potwakali, Shatkira, Bagherhat, Kolna, Feni, over the last few 30 years, they did not, the salinity level did not increase much. But what happened? The neighboring districts on the northern part, northern side of that particular, uh, that uh, those districts also greatly impacted by the salinity. That which was not uh, affected by the salinity in uh, before 1973, it was now it is under the saline condition and the soil or cultivable arable lands are under salinity region. So this is the mechanism how salinity impact the yield loss. So. Uh, salinity has an uh, impact on the osmotic uh, regulation, how it's al ultimately low water potential of the plant. Plant growth is low and ill loss. And also have some ion effect, road uh, uptake also decreased, direct foliar absorption, and ultimately which causes the leaf burning and uh, dead tissues, and which is causes the ill loss. And also the pH have some uh, impact to manage the micronutrient availability. That's why some diseases appears like chlorosis, and something, so some other the diseases. So it uh, also impacted on the yield loss. Another one is the drought. So drought stress refers to the adverse impact that occur when plants experience a prolonged period of water scarcity or li limited water. We can see that uh, uh, African countries are more vulnerable or more prone to a, a drought prone areas. Whereas that next one is the Asian countries. And among them, uh, Bangladesh has the uh, number three, who is are under the threat of uh, drought uh, risk. So we have to think also about particular the northern part of this uh, country and drought, how drought can cause the impacts. So there are some uh, rip, um, reports like if severe drought occur, they uh, around 12 million hectares of land lost every year and increase uh, percent of the affected plants of the ecosystem. Summer drought in 2003, 30% reduction of the photosystems in the European ecosystem, around 0.5 uh, gigaton net carbon release, and mega fires in Australia in 2019-20, around 3 billion animals were dead, affected the ecosystem. So from this scenario, we can imagine that what uh, a drought and drought-related uh, catastrophes can cause the hamper of our li uh, livestock and agricultural sectors. Particularly in Bangladesh, we can see that rainfall exceeds the potential evapotranspiration in monsoon months, but is less than evapotranspiration in the remaining months. And also dry season evapotranspiration exceeds more than 0.5 times than the monsoon season, which is accelerating drought and affecting food security. So this is the drought from rainfall uh, changes around the, over the time. So it, uh, we need to uh, think about that around during the dry season in the northern part of the Bangladesh. As marked here, the severely affected part of the country, like the Pabna, Shirazgan, Joshua, it's a northern part of the country. And uh, it also faced some case of uh, agricultural uh, decrease in production, uh, so, and causes the food insecurity. Here is the scenario, and the uh, level of extent of uh, risks or threats under these uh, districts. And we can see that uh, 
Panchagor and Thakurgao, the most uh, northern part of the districts are very uh, severe risks. And then Dinaspur, Nil, Famari, Gaibanda, these districts are under the risks of uh, drought and 9.42 percent area of this uh, countries uh, in case of Panchagor and Thakurgao. Another one is the extreme flood. Extreme flood uh, actually in, in uh, wetland of the country, particularly in the nor uh, northern eastern side of the country also face this uh, uh, natural calamities because uh, this is the sudden flood. And it also have uh, devastating effects on crops, livestock and agricultural productivity, which floods uh, cause over uh, half of agricultural disasters and the consequence include higher prices of food storage. So these floods causes the erosion of the soil, water logging sometimes, and salinization in case of coastal areas. So we can see that the extreme floods in causes that due to the rainfall or over, uh, river overflow and human activities like deforestation and urbanization causes the extreme flood. In case uh, due to the frequency and intensity of heavy rainfall due to the impact of climate change also causes the extreme flood. And the number of extreme floods uh, over the years, we can see that in 2007, 2008, there was uh, few, and in 2003 also, that extreme floods was uh, appeared, number of increased. And extreme floods, how uh, its impacts. So it is that some disaster change. It's not only, the, on, only that area, particular area that is facing the extreme flood, but also the consequences or effects also from the other part and the effect not only from the agricultural production, it also has the effect on environmental pollution, social impact, and economic condition and overall in the livelihood pattern. So direct and indirect impact have all been reported due to or all have been observed due to these extreme floods. In low-lying developing country, Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change and also uh, around 60% of this land mass is situated less than six meters above sea level. A flood submerged around the 30% of the 70% area of the country due to the flash flood. And the, due to the climate change, around uh, 10 to 15% rise in mean month. I think um, Dr. John has just got dropped for technical problems. Let's just wait for him. Okay, sir, he's here. Sir, can you hear us? Yes, yeah, sorry. Actually, uh, the electricity issue causes the interruption of the internet. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you just okay, fine. Actually, sorry for this situation. So, no, no, sir. No okay, I'm continuing again. Yeah, sure, sir. Okay. So we can sh uh, see your slide, sir. You can continue. Okay. Okay. Just okay. okay. So actually, uh, that uh, uh, sorry for the interruption. So again, uh, I think you can see my slides. Uh, here is the flash floods, which uh, carry a heavy sediment load and causes the heavy monsoon rain. River floods uh, occur between May and September. So this all the cyclonic floods and other things causes the uh, different impacts uh, on not only the agriculture but also the livelihood pattern. Here is the uh, consequences of uh, uh, different uh, uh, number of uh, areas affected during the flash flood uh, in Bangladesh. This is a little bit uh, 
old data from 1988 and it, uh, 1998. It was a very uh, remarkable. Yeah, was... So this is, and we can see that uh, loss of production uh, during the 1970 to 2019 compared to the average of the previous and following peak year. So we can see that in 2017, in the non-coast region, there was a remarkable uh, disaster caused the flood, and it is uh, the this is the decrease in uh, log crop production. So around uh, billions of tons of uh, crop uh, production was decreased. Uh, this is the uh, uh, shifting of occupation uh, as was well uh, in a study in the Chor areas of Bangladesh in 2017 reported. So this is the uh, kind of uh, uh, shifting of the occupation because uh, due to the uh, flash flood, people migrated from the another area and that time during the flood season, there was no job. They need to uh, generate new uh, occupation for their uh, living beings. So, okay, this is this all the, are the consequences of climate change. Now I want, want to focus on the climate resilient agriculture. So as we already uh, discussed and we already all informed about the climate consequences of climate change on the agriculture. So we need to think about how we can uh, increase or how we can uh, maintain our agricultural production even under the threat of climate change. So if uh, we, uh, I focus on the climate resilient agriculture, we can see that it is actually an approach of farming that focuses on building resilience to the impact of climate change. That means we cannot uh, change some uh, uh, reasons of the climate change, but we can maintain or we can uh, continue our uh, production of, from agricultural sector, uh, even under the, uh, uh, we have the consequences of the climate change. So practice and the techniques that can help crops and livestock withstand extreme weather events. As its core, climate resilient agriculture is about working with nature, not against it, and also, it uh, involves a practice like diversifying crops, improving soil health, and reduces the vulnerability to climate shocks. So there are main uh, three pillars, sustainability, building resilience, and reducing greenhouse gas emission. So we have to keep in mind when we are thinking about climate change resilience, that we have to reduce greenhouse gases, building resilience, and sustainability. So uh, for the greenhouse gas emission, we can see that uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and that causes climate change, which actually impact on uh, agriculture. And how we can make the climate is agriculture. We have to have two things. One is the adaptation and mitigation. And all these things also uh, address the vulnerability to climate change. And if we uh, consider these uh, approaches, we can make that climate resilient agriculture. So adaptation, actually adjustment in the ecological and uh, other systems uh, uh, to uh, mitigate their or to, to response their uh, against the impacts of climate change. And mitigation is the intervention to reduce the emission and sources uh, of enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. So if we want to reduce or we can uh, think about the agricultural system, we have to think about Okay, for the next uh, approaches, we have to keep in mind that how we can reduce the greenhouse gas emission from our crop fields or even our from livestock. So mitigation strategies against this uh, climate change, cropland management, so we can manage our crop fields in from different kinds and also livestock management. And uh, because uh, uh, for the feeding uh, practices and from the, the dietary additives, we can include or initiate manure management for, to maintain the good health of the soil. We think about that, uh, how we can manage our uh, soil or our uh, manage, uh, maintain our productivity from the soil, even uh, with the soil health is degrading. So there are some technologies already suggested that, uh, for resilient agriculture. One is the improved crop varieties, crop diversification, soil and water conservation, agroforestry, and lastly, the vertical agriculture. So in case of crop diversification, 
crop diversification ensure not only uh, the uh, to cope with the new uh, different crops under different uh, environmental condition or climatic condition but also ensure food security nutritional security and also generate uh, some employment opportunities and in bangladesh crop diversification also increasing uh, day by day and uh, we are uh, sufficient in the food production and also crop, uh, crop varieties uh, focusing on the adaptive adapting crop varieties uh, due to uh, climate change there are some varieties which are uh, resistant or who have the capability to withstand the effect of stress so there are some uh, uh, tolerant varieties have been uh, uh, published and the, yeah, this is the list of stress tolerant varieties uh, from different kinds from rice and from other things also and here is the listed uh, listing of rice varieties that can withstand salinity drought or submergence and some also uh, some micronutrient and these like zinc and these rice varieties also here another technology for, for resilient agriculture soil and water conservation so soil and water conservation is means uh, it means that uh, we have to uh, conserve soil and it, it, in that case we can practice the agroforestry techniques forest and integrated uh, farm uh, agricultural production which reduce can reduce soil erosion increase nitrogen fixation maintain soil moisture decrease water wastage all these factors impact on the growth of the crops and we can see how the here is a scenario with the forest in the uh, left side uh, figure and in case of uh, in the picture of the right side without forest so they have, that have some increase of uh, soil erosion and uh, and causes the degradation of the soil another thing is the agroforestry agroforestry uh, practices like uh, crop production with the other plants it can also improve the uh, soil health and production now the i want to focus on my vertical agriculture or resilient towards climate change what is uh, which is my uh, main focus my research area uh, actually belongs to this category so this is the vertical agriculture because we know that that um, agriculture land is decreasing due to some kind of uh, agri uh, climatic factors and the population is increasing so from the same uh, small area we have to increase production we have to increase uh, uh, to ensure more production for the future in that uh, keeping this mind we also adapting the farming system to climate change impact and vertical agriculture also is the solution for utilizing vertical space in a controlled environment so vertical agriculture not only uh, ensure the space utilization also it has impact on uh, pest infestation, insect infestation, and other kind of natural hazards uh, is uh, keep free the plant products. So it is enhanced agricultural sustainability and resilience in the face of climate change and other challenges. So all of we know that it is an, uh, maximizing space utilization and also water use efficiency. And it is uh, uh, very popular in case of urban areas. There are three kinds, hydrophonics, aeroponics, aquaponics. So hydroponics is the totally depending on the nutrient solution. Aeroponics is the spraying the solution on the rooting zone of the plant. And aquaponics means the uh, crop production according, uh, along with the fish production. So this is the aquaponics. So I will focus on the hydroponic system. And hydroponics is actually, I already discussed the population growth reduction of agricultural lands and man -made and uh, consumption is uh, consumption of fruits and vegetables highly decrease the risks of many types of chronic disease uh, in human so also the we have to think about the nutrient security so if, if uh, in, we cultivate or we uh, grow the crops or vegetables in the hydroponic system we can also manipulate the nutrient composition of the plants pro plants or plant products so this is the uh, flow diagram of the uh, how the hydroponic system work there is a solution for nutrient solution it is uh, circulated and uh, the plant uh, in the plant rooting zone so root zone uh, uh, intake the nutrients and plant growth uh, is maintained and under the uh, artificial light or sunlight so this is the system so my research area actually focus on to explore the potentialities of fruits and vegetables grown in 
soilless system to mitigate mal malnutrition. So we use the nutrient solution, Hogland solution. It is actually modified Hogland solution. And uh, we wanted to know if we change the composition of nutrient concentration. So what will be the changes in the plant products? We decided to check these uh, events in case of tomato, capsicum, and lettuce. And we selected three varieties of three crops. And we measured the, some biochemical composition and some physiological responses under different nutrient solution. Here is the pictures of a tomato experiment. We can see that during uh, due to the different uh, nectar treatment, the growth and the maturity of the tomato varied depending on the nit uh, nitrate concentration. Here is the results of uh, biochemical and uh, nutritional uh, composition of tomato. Due to the nitrate increase, we can see that protein concentration increase. So if we can uh, uh, increase the nitrate con supplementation in the hydroponic system, we can increase the uh, protein concentration also of that tom particular tomato. We observed that uh, due to the, uh, at a dose of one molar nitrate, that uh, DPPH inhibition, that is the antioxidant uh, inhibition also increased. That means it can uh, cope with the, uh, it can fight with this nutrient solution and uh, it can maintain uh, the uh, growth even under the uh, nitrate uh, availability. And then also total chlorophyll content also increased due to this. Other things also are almost comparable with the soil grown uh, areas. There was no uh, remarkable changes. In case of uh, catalase, this is actually the enzyme which maintains the, the antioxidant capacity or the, the stress management. So we can see that uh, in case of one molar nitrate, it can uh, uh, cope with the nitrate stress or nitrate solution and it can maintain its growth and performance even under this uh, uh, concentration of the nitrate. That's why we found that uh, one molar nitrate showed uh, the better production, better coloring and uh, the uh, of the uh, product. Next, this is the lettuce. In case of lettuce, we can see that this is the pictures of different uh, lettuce uh, under different nitrate concentration. We can see that uh, due to the uh, increase in nitrate, the leaf area increased, leaf length increased and leaf width also increased. And we observed that up to the two molar nitrate, we can increase uh, the volume of the, or the uh, weight of the lettuce leaves. However, and there also number of leaves also increased. However, root length decreased uh, because that uh, due to the scarcity of the nutrient solution or nitrate concentration, uh, the root length also extended to seek for the uh, nutrient uh, solution. In case of uh, other uh, parameters, we can see that uh, total chlorophyll content uh, increased. That's a greening of the uh, increase due to the nitrate concentration and ascorbate. It is actually the vitamin C. Vitamin C concentration also increased. In case of uh, protein, in case of lettuce, it's also increased that we also observed in the other crop. So from this uh, the pictures or the results, we can see that uh, all this biochemical composition can be modified by modifying the nutrient solution. So if we want to get nutrient uh, intensive or nutrient dense uh, crop production, we can also increase, uh, we can also use the hydroponic system for uh, better crop production. So this is the uh, PCA uh, by plot. So it's only to compare the all parameters and uh, summarize it to which treatment are uh, comparable. So we found that that soil grown and T1 treatment was uh, T2 and T1 treatment also uh, almost the, giving the similar kind of responses uh, in, in terms of biochemical and nutritional composition. And we also had some sensory attributes uh, data. And we found that uh, one molar and two molar nitrate supplementation can give the good results. And it is most better than in some particular points like bitterness, mouth taste, aroma, and the color, appearance, so overall acceptance. So this uh, uh, hydrophonically grown lettuce also have uh, performed better than on component to the soil grown. And the uh, biochemical and nutritional composition also almost variable. So this is the capsicum. In case of capsicum, we observed that fruit number increased, but up to the one molar, but high nitrate concentration decreased the uh, fruit, fruit numbers per plant. 
and other things was not uh, significant, but beta carotene content was uh, increased by one uh, T1 treatment. And in case of total chlorophyll, there is a dose dependency increased, though that uh, data was not significantly different. Uh, in case of tractive uh, APX, this is the another uh, anti antioxidant enzyme, enzymatic uh, which can also have the dose dependently increased. And tractable acidity also increased due to in case of capsicum. And uh, growth protein, as it was expected, it also increased by nitrate treatment. When we compared in the PCF biplot, we observed that T1 treatment uh, showed the almost the similar result with the soil grown. That is, one molar nitrate was uh, was performed better, whereas two molar was the high concentration for the plants because it's a fruiting uh, body. So one molar we can suggest. Even in the uh, appearance and the test, it, it was observed that T1 performed better in types of uh, some sensory attributes. So in conclusion, we can see Sorry, now you can hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, there is an interaction, internet issues maybe. So actually I was in this slide. So this is the uh, way forward, what we are thinking about. So we need to re uh, prioritize greenhouse gas emission and reduction. Uh, so we have to reduce. So we have to think about smart agriculture or some kind of agriculture and agriculture sources to reduce the greenhouse emission, which will ultimately mitigate climate change impact. And structured training, we need to train up our stakeholders to build confidence and raise awareness about climate change. So we cannot, uh, we cannot enhance the deforestation or uh, some kind of human-oriented uh, hamper to the, our soil and environment. National implementation of the climate resilient agriculture practices need to be uh, broad scale uh, uh, implementation is important. Farmer oriented programs need to be enhanced because that it will focus on empowering farmers and, and enhancing skill in agriculture and related sectors. And we furthermore, we need to a collaborative approach, which will ultimately ensure the foster collaboration among uh, farmers, research institution, funding agencies, government and NGOs, and private sector to promote climate resilience agriculture effectively. Considering all these things, we have to have a three Win, uh, three win approach, uh, triple win, that uh, outcomes will be enhanced productivity, resilience, and carbon sequestration. So uh, this, if we can uh, maintain the climate resilience agriculture, it will enhance our productivity and also make the reduce susceptibility to water scarcity, pest, and other climate related adverse events and improve the capacity of adapt, uh, to adapt and grow in the face of longer term stresses like shortened seasons and erratic weather patterns. And it will also reduce emission in the uh, processed food production, avoid deforestation, and promote methods to capture and remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. All these things uh, will ensure a healthy uh, condition, healthy condition for the agricultural production. And we have to think about different diversified ways. And from every corner of our research part, we have to think about climate change and is uh, to mitigate its impacts on the agri not only agriculture for other sectors for our better world. 
So thank you all. Thank you for your patience hearing. So I hope I have uh, finished my presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, should we start the next presentation or we need to... Uh, we can just start the next presentation. Okay. I will request uh, our next presenter, uh, Professor Dr. Mahmoud Jahangir sir, to start his presentation. Sir, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you and we can okay. see the Okay. Can you see the slides? Uh, I think, uh, thank you, Saran. I, I think you already have covered uh, most of my slides uh, regarding the climate change and agricultural impacts and also some mitigation options. So maybe I'll take only uh, 10, 20 minutes because I don't uh, like to share again the, uh, uh, the same slides with the uh, audiences. So good evening, everybody, and uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I think John already introduced me. I am uh, Mohammad Jahangir, a professor of soil science at Bangladesh Agricultural University. So my research interest mainly on nutrient dynamics in soils, especially in terrestrial and aquatic system, and all on measurement and mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, uh, we already uh, have come to know a lot about uh, global warming, greenhouse gas emissions. So we see here uh, the earth is burning actually because of uh, increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the effect of these greenhouse gas emissions, global warming is now visible, especially in Bangladesh. We every day see the differences. And every people now know and they say there is uh, something wrong with the climate system, which is changing. Okay, why don't it change? Sir, you can use the mouse and click the next slide. I think uh, keyboard. Okay, oh, it doesn't change. It. Okay, now it's okay, good. Okay, yes. Sir. Okay, so what actually, what are the, uh, the problems with our current focus? I, I did not mention the topic. I will concentrate on uh, climate change mitigation through improved agricultural practices especially a special uh, focus on uh, soil, how soil management can uh, function as a sink for greenhouse gas emissions, can improve uh, air and water quality, and also can balance with crop production, at the same time with soil health and uh, the environment. So we have three uh, key challenges that uh, we can concentrate on uh, soil management to balance these three three important aspects. So we have conventional agricultural practices. Actually, these practices have caused serious concerns about air and water quality because we see uh, repeated plowing or no addition of uh, organic manure, no uh, retention of crop residues, this kind of uh, processes uh, increasing greenhouse gas emissions. They are uh, destroying soil health, soil biodiversity, and consequently we require more, more and more fertilizers to apply because of uh, nutrient mining, nutrient depletion, and soil degradation, uh, especially for uh, nutrients and organic matter. And the nutrient use efficiency, especially nitrogen, is uh, low it's, uh, in compared to many European, even many Asian countries. We see here nitrogen use is rising and uh, about 60% of total fertilizer is nitrogen. However, the nitrogen use efficiency is about 30% only or 30 to 35%. So what happens with the rest of uh, the nitrogen that we are applying in the field, about 65 to 70% of nitrogen is going to the atmosphere, going to the groundwater, to the uh, surface water, and where are they going? They are damaging the system. 
depending on their forms. If it is like nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas, if it is nitrate, if it is ammonium, they uh, actually uh, deteriorate water quality and consequently they um, affect human health and also ecological health. And so we have to uh, reduce the chemical fertilizer application to maintain uh, the soil ecosystem or agricultural ecosystem to maintain a good ecological status of our surface water and groundwater. But the fertilizer application uh, should not be inadequate to grow crops or should not be uh, surplus or excessive because excessive fertilizer not only causes problem with uh, economic cost, but it also causes some environmental cost. And if it is inadequate, this fertilizer causes problem with soil nutrient mining because we, we our soil is under pressure for producing more crops. So to produce more crops, to increase cropping intensity, uh, we cannot apply inadequate fertilizers. Fertilizers should be adequate in suitable uh, proportion to, uh, to maintain fertility and to maintain productivity. If it is inadequate, then that means the crop will uptake the nutrient from the native soil, from native organic matter, and it will cause a depletion in the nutrient content. Therefore, the question arises then, what should be the fertilizer recommendation? How can we recommend fertilizer that will maintain uh, an amount of fertilizer that uh, crop need and that will reduce nutrient um, a loss to the environment and also that will maintain crop production? This is a big challenge for, for our agroecosystem. And we have to concentrate on soil quality and environmental aspects, especially for greenhouse gas emissions. So far, uh, it's, uh, it's very unfortunate that we all know this. Bangladesh is providing greenhouse gas inventory data based on the, on the desk, not in the field. We don't use the measured data. We don't ask people uh, to measure data or we don't see uh, how much data we have currently in the country the regional measured data. We only produce the data, the inventory based on the desk computer and then some IPCC coefficient and that's, that's enough, the default values. But my question, how long we will go with this desk, desk type uh, inventory development? We have to go to the field, we have to measure the greenhouse gas emissions. Then we can uh, take strategies to reduce emissions or if there is no emission, then maybe we can ignore it. But first we have to measure it. This is currently Bangladesh is lacking. Uh, we don't have measured data, not much data. There's a, a few of uh, them are available, but they have no value because we are not using this for uh, greenhouse gas inventory. And then what are the drivers or the factors that are actually reducing nutrient use efficiency or nitrogen use efficiency if we know what are the causes uh, that are driving low nutrient use efficiency, then maybe we can manage this. So our objective from this presentation, we will evaluate soil crop and fertilizer management practices, conventional versus some advanced practices that uh, Chayon, uh, Professor Chayon already mentioned what should be the advanced practices. Sometimes conservation agriculture practices, sometimes people are using biochar, sometimes people suggesting for integrated nutrient management using organic amendment and uh, also composting in another approach. In Bangladesh, we now use barmy compost, trico compost, many other composters. So we, we have to combine all these technologies uh, so that we can manage our soil, crop, water, fertilizer in an efficient way. And then we have to recommend fertilizer, like fertilizer rate, fertilizer method, fertilizer test, fertilizer, like four R with a method, time, rate, sources. We have to synchronize this so that uh, we can balance then production, we can balance then uh, soil health, we can manage then uh, environmental health. That means we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we can reduce carbon degradation, we can uh, sequester carbon rather from the atmosphere, we can uh, sink through soil. And to evaluate soil quality for the sustenance of soil fertility, that means we have to check with the nutrient pools, nutrient dynamics, and finally balance. If we see here uh, one example for, uh, that fertilizer used in Bangladesh, 
like 1951 and this uh, decade, we uh, had only nitrogen deficiency in agriculture. But over time, only in this uh, 50, 60 years, we have now seven nutrient deficiencies. That means we needed like 60 years back, we needed only one fertilizer to apply nitrogen. And in 50 or 60 years, we now need to apply at least seven fertilizers. So seven fertilizers for seven nutrients. So if it happens, if it is continued in business as usual, that means maybe in the next 20, 30 years, we have to apply all 16 or 17 essential plant nutrients to fertilizer, which is impossible, which indicate that our soil ecosystem will be completely destroyed to cope with the uh, production pressure. Okay, so what are the challenges? Um, most of these actually covered by uh, Professor Sun. We have problem with food, fuel, and fiber. We have problem with global warming. We have problem with irrigation water, both quality and quantity. We have some areas in Western and uh, Northern part that uh, desertification already started there. As Sun already showed, the evapotranspiration demand is higher than the rainfall, which is indicating a drought prone region in Bangladesh. And we have problem with drinking water pollution, especially in the steel zone. Uh, we have heavy metal pollution and also in some um, extensive agricultural areas, we have groundwater pollution by uh, nutrients. We have biodiversity destruction, soil degradation. As I mentioned, we have degradation of soil organic matter, degradation and depletion of uh, almost all plant nutrients. Therefore, we need to apply more and more and more fertilizer. And we have uh, challenge with land use changes especially for cropland are sacrificed for uh, other uses. If we think about globally, food insecurity uh, is, is rising, the globe, uh, especially by 2050, maybe we need to increase uh, about 40% of food from our current production. While we have problem with land degradation, we have problem with salinization, we have problem with acidification, we have problem with flooding, we have problem with other uh, climatic hazards. And in these challenges to produce food is actually um, the main business for the global leaders. So by 2050, the current about 8 billion people will either reach or exceed 9 billion. That means need 40% uh, more food from the limited uh, land resources because land resource is not constant. We will see uh, for this increasing production, what is the crisis, especially in Bangladesh? We have, um, uh, I think so, and already showed this. I don't need to uh, repeat them. Just one example, in 2018, we had some uh, in a millions dollar loss in rice grain be because of heat, st heat stress. When uh, the temperature exists in the environment more than 30 degrees Celsius for a week, it causes uh, uh, lack in fertilization in rice. Uh, there's no emphasis, no pollen grain and no fertilization and it causes like uh, grainless seed. Actually, if we think globally, we have only 3% arable land, 3% agricultural land for producing food for the teeming population. If you think, think about 100 years back, who has provided the food? This is soil. And now for 8 billion people, where are we producing the food? Except some uh, hydroponic system as Sun showed, most uh, about 95% or more than 95% food are coming from soil. And if you think about 100 years later, the, this is the same. Soil will provide us with, with the food, where we have only 3% arable land to produce food. And this 3% again under uh, deterioration due to climate change effects, especially salinization, acidification, and land degradation. So the challenge is now clear that actually we, are, we will be facing huge challenge for uh, coping with our uh, food production. Poor soil fertility worldwide is a major problem. If you uh, just compare in Bangladesh, China, Korea, and some African countries, we have far better soil than the African countries. And if we increase fertilizer use, we improve management, we have good varieties, and we can increase about, uh, in recent report, they mentioned about 88% of the food production is possible with improved technology. 
But if you go with the same technology, same more fertilizer, good variety to African countries, you cannot increase. You can do only 28% increase. That means soil fertility is, is, is the main driver to increase uh, crop production. We have problem desertification I mentioned. Over 20, 50 million people, 250 million people are directly affected by 1 billion at risk, where 1 billion at risk, but 20, uh, 250 directly affected. Global desertification cost about 42 billion US dollar per year and 12 million hectare per year lost due to drought and desertification. That means we are losing land every year and huge and potential land we are losing, but that means our land Natural resources are squeezing. So major agricultural challenges, limited irrigation water. We have problem with climate change, as a, especially if we uh, compare with Bangladesh, we have first problem salinization in the coastal zone. We have problem in the Northern part for acidification, North Western part for uh, desertification. We have uh, east, east, uh, Eastern part uh, for flooding, the flash flooding in the Howard region. So we have, and then in the in the central part, we have problem with soil organic matter degradation and nutrient depletion, and also some heavy metal pollution in the in the steel zone. So how can soil help? Soil uh, provide nutrients to uh, to plants, purify water. That is all the wastewater is going to underground. Actually, is is purified by soil, contributing to atmosphere because soil can function as a sink for global carbon emissions. And this is a, uh, harboring the biodiversity. Soils and ecosystem services, if we see at a, at a glance here, soils are at the root of many ecosystem services, especially for food, fuel, fiber, uh, biodiversity, uh, global climate sense mitigation at its function as a sink. So this is kind of and the climate change, I, I, we, I think we already know and believe this, the climate system is changing. I don't need to talk here. The in, rise in uh, greenhouse gases, dilution of carbon dioxide. This is kind of isotopic technique. This is the sign of climate change, maybe a funny example for climate change. Just one example here, uh, recently a uh, report on Bangladesh, Kairosas, I think you all know this, they identified some hot spot of methane emission in Bangladesh. Unfortunately, we could not measure, we, we, we don't have any measured data. So my focus is on, on measuring greenhouse gas emission in agricultural system, both in terrestrial and aquatic system. Maybe in the river, in wetland, in how, in rice ecosystem, in every system we have to uh, measure greenhouse gas emissions and when we have data then we can challenge that actually how much we are emitting and how much we are sinking so how we, we contribute global if we are increasing climate change influencing negatively or positively then we, we can claim only if we have measured data okay how, how soil can help actually i am saying about the soil soil can function as a sink soil can sequester carbon many many evidence but how can soil help this? If you see here global carbon distribution, in biosphere, we have only 800, 500 to 800 gigaton carbon in the atmosphere uh, and in plants, that is biosphere in only 550, while soil in soil, it is more than 2000. That means soil has the largest potential, especially in compared to biosphere and atmosphere, that it has potential to sink carbon, uh, to accommodate more carbon, uh, within uh, soil and subsoil. So the main challenge people are trying to bring carbon uh, from atmosphere to the soil because uh, soil has the ability to accommodate more, ca more carbon. This country or developed countries, they are trying to accommodate carbon dioxide in the underground, maybe in subsurface environment because they have money, they have um, investment. But for, for us, we don't have that much money to to accommodate carbon dioxide from atmosphere to underground. But what we can do, we can improve our management, agricultural management practices that can uh, sequester carbon, that can, we can convert carbon dioxide to carbohydrate by, by photosynthesis. If we look at here, this is, if we have solar radiation, then carbon dioxide from the atmosphere will go uh, into the plants. That is the, actually, these plants are actually carbon dioxide, carbohydrate, and this carbon dioxide, that means this carbohydrate we can incorporate into soil. That means 
So this carbonization and incorporation is finally uh, converting carbon dioxide to organic matter in soil. This is the way we can uh, sequester carbon. Okay, we know already carbon sequestration and uh, the main two mechanism of carbon sequestration. One, we can increase our uh, car carbohydrate production uh, that is converted from carbon dioxide and we can uh, protect them in soil by soil aggregation. Soil aggregate means uh, this is smallest unit of soil, this is a systematic arrangement of particles. And within this, this aggregate, within this uh, kind of, um, uh, how can we explain this clod, we can accommodate carbon, uh, especially the recalcitrant carbon or stable carbon that is physically protected from degradation in the in aggregate. Okay, so how agriculture can help? Agricultural practices collect collectively can make a significant contribution at low cost by increasing soil carbon sinks, by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and by contributing biomass feed stock for, for energy use. That means the feed stock, the more feed stock we produce, that means more carbon dioxide we, we sequester, more carbon dioxide we trap, more carbon dioxide we convert to carbohydrate. Especially in cropland, we can follow reduced tillage. This is experimentally and nationally and internationally evident that we can increase soil carbon content if we reduce uh, tillage. Rotation, crop rotation, especially with leguminous crops. Cover crops, we don't have much space for cover cropping, but we can keep our, our soil surface covered, especially with increased cropping intensity. And fertility management, Erosion control, irrigation management, these all can all together can help increase soil carbon content, can uh, mitigate carbon dioxide emission, and can trap carbon dioxide from atmosphere into the soil. Uh, rice paddy, this is an unique ecosystem. This is a unique ecosystem where we can sequester more carbon because of this anaerobic, anaerobic uh, conditions or wetland conditions. So we can reduce chemical fertilizer application. We can incorporate more carbon through uh, crop residues, rice residues, more carbon through uh, rice roots. And we can reduce uh, irrigation water input, chemical fertilizer input. That means if we can reduce chemical fertilizer, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions from the transport from the industry. An agroforestry system, uh, so I already mentioned this agroforestry system can help uh, sequestering more carbon in, in agricultural land. This is kind of mechanism we can help. So what are actually the potential management practices we can do for sequestering carbon? Number one, conservation agriculture practice uh, and using biochar, composting, green manuring, and mulching. This all together can significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, can help carbon build up in soil, can increase organic matter content in soil, and can increase nutrient content in soil, can help uh, conserving soil moisture, and can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So what is conservation agriculture? Uh, maybe uh, People from non agriculture then they won't be much interested in this uh, more academic presentation. Conservation agriculture uh, has mainly three pillars. That minimum tillage, that is we, re we reduce number of tillage and depth of tillage. We, we leave some residues, crop residues, because currently people cut uh, their crops just above the ground. That means they don't like to leave any residues. They always bringing the soil uh, to their home, but they never like to leave soil anything. But whatever, soil cannot sustain this way that all is providing us with food, feed, everything, but it is not getting back anything. So the conservation agriculture then suggests to, re to retain some residues in, in soil for uh, reducing acidity and for improving carbon content. And then suitable crop rotation. We, we shouldn't uh, cultivate the same crop always. And in, within a pattern, we sh should include some, especially some leguminous crops. There are some examples that always leave uh, crop residues on the surface. That means it prevents, um, if we leave residues, it prevents soil erosion, it prevents moisture loss, so conserves more moisture, and it pro protects soil from erosion, and it certainly adds organic matter because these residues have 30 to 40% organic matter. 
tillage is not necessary for crop production. Some earlier or like 20 years back, people thought that tillage is very important, but now it is evident that tillage is not always important, but for some crop that is definitely important. Crop residues are a very valuable part of farming system and must be retained in full or uh, full or partially because there is another challenge. People use these residues for uh, cooking purpose or for feeding their animal. But if we ask them to sacrifice maybe 20 or 30% of these residues, if we can convince the farmers by policy or by agricultural extension department, maybe we can increase crop residue retention and we can increase soil carbon content. Okay, carbon sequestration, I already mentioned what is carbon sequestration and what um, the benefit we can get from carbon sequestration, especially carbon enhances soil organic matter content, improves soil health, ensures uh, sustainable soil fertility, and reduces agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. So soil health means here soil will sustain a uh, very good ecological status, especially microorganisms, micro and microorganisms in soils. So it has good diversity and we have microbial co uh, community composition, microbial structure is good. That And then if the soil physical environment is good, that is more aggregated soils, more aeration, more water and nutrient movement. And then if we have more organic matter, that means this is a stock of uh, other nutrients then we can claim that, yes, this is a healthy soil. Okay, so for management, I already mentioned tillage practices can increase organic matter. If we reduce tillage, that it can help increase organic matter content. The question is how? If we follow here soil uh, macro aggregates and soil macro aggregate here, but if we repeatedly till the soil, plow the soil, that means it destroys the aggregate and then organic matter uh, uh, present in soil is exposed to the uh, sunlight and to oxygen, then organic matter uh, then burns, decomposes. But if, if they are protected in the aggregate, then they don't de degrade, they don't decompose, then they, um, they get deposited in soil and thus increase organic matter content. If we see the scenario, global scenario of uh, conservation agricultural practices, this is a rising technology in the world, especially US and Australia, they are, um, they are following conservation agricultural practices. And in Bangladesh, we have been conducting some experiments on conservation agriculture since uh, 2012. And we already have found some positive results, some improvement in soil quality, even improvement in uh, crop production and also a reduction in total uh, global warming potential of soil. Just one of the examples, if we say reduce tillage, that means we, di we didn't plow the land. We, we leave this unfertile soils in 20 centimeter no task on this turf soil. And in between 20 centimeter, we have a small line, two to three centimeter line, and we can plant or we can sit so here. So without tilling, we can grow crop here and leave crop residues. If we see here, residue retention, reduced tillage and rotation. We have wheat, we have mug bean and rice. So we have a good combination of crops, one legumes, one wheat and, and rice. And we have an example of the experiment that we have been contact, conducting here at Bangladesh Agriculture University campus since 2012. Okay, so the evidence from our, this experiment, we see, if we see here, this is a conservation agricultural practice and this is your conventional agricultural practice. If you follow uh, the plant color, this is rice. This is almost yellowing, started yellowing, but this here, uh, rice plants are darker. That means they reduce the nitrogen or other fertilizer requirement here, but they, have st they still need more uh, fertilizer and we can reduce fertilizer application here. We have better growth and we found better yield also in compared to the conventional system. And I'll share you some soil data that actually it is helping improve soil health, soil quality, crop production, and also reducing fertilizer need, fertilizer requirement. And another surprising example, if you follow here for Mugmin, and uh, last Two years back, we had um, heavy rainfall just after sowing. And in conventional agricultural plots, we don't have much plant population, almost nil. 
But if you see here, conservation agriculture plot, this is the same field, same field, same management, same environment, everything same, seed rate is same, but this is conservation agriculture practice and this is conventional. And you see here, plant population is um, almost uh, sustaining here in this plot, but here no plant population. It, it indicates that so our soil is, uh, is now resilient Again, environmental impact, again, uh, against the heavy rainfall, where conventional system could not sustain any plant. Okay, there are some soil quality data, maybe I don't need to mention this, but I can say soil quality, soil physical properties, soil chemical properties, nutritional status, even microbial properties improved a lot in conservation agriculture practice. Okay, and then we started measuring greenhouse gas emissions. Here, one an example for nitrous oxide emission in wheat in this uh, in the same field. But here, mean nitrous oxide fluxes were about 110 times, 10% 10 higher in conservation agriculture practices than conventional management practices. So this is opposite to our hypothesis that conservation agriculture reduced greenhouse gas emissions. But for nitrous oxide, conservation agriculture increased uh, nitrous oxide emission in compared to conventional practices. And we already we also maintain some higher crop residue retention in, in conservation practices and residue retention also linearly increased nitrous oxide emissions. We published the, the, this data in Agriculture Ecosystem and Environment Journal. If you want, you can I can share the uh, the article. Okay, now then we analyze uh, soil protein contents so to see the, uh, the biological indicator if the soil health condition is improving or not. And we found significantly higher uh, protein, uh, fungal glomalin content actually in conservation agriculture practices in compared to conventional. So it indicates that biological diversification and uh, community composition increased in conservation agriculture practice. Then we analyze some enzyme content in soil and we see conservation agriculture increase uh, beta glucosidase, nitrogenase and other enzyme content in soil. We publish this data in Applied Soil Ecology. If somebody wants, we can share later on. These are some soil data, soil organic carbon content, microbial uh, biomass carbon, total nitrogen, this, and we, we found significantly higher organic carbon, nitrogen, and microbial biomass carbon in conservation agriculture in compared to uh, the conventional method. Here I should mention that this, this data we, we evaluated uh, about 10 years after the initiation of uh, conservation agriculture practices. Though the changes is not actually that rap rapid. Soil is a, is a very robust, very complex, and very heterogeneous system. It does not really change that quickly. So we found uh, significant changes started after five years of adoption of conservation agriculture. And after 10 years, we found um, very distinct, very clear uh, differences between conservation and conventional uh, management practices. Okay, then from this experiment, after 10 years of evaluation, we found organic carbon stock in conservation agriculture increased by about 0.5 ton carbon per hectare. Grain yield increased, nitrogen use efficiency increased because nitrogen requirement of crops decreased in conservation agriculture practices. This data we, we published in field crop research. If anybody want, we can share. Okay, and then we have another field experiment where we follow only rice, rice, and rice. So this is not actually true conservation agriculture because in conservation agriculture, one condition that we have to change uh, crop rotation. I mean, uh, there should be a good cropping pattern, not only rice, rice, and rice. No, there is no rotation, but we meant we maintain two other uh, pillars of conservation agriculture conventional practice and strip planting that is no non part non paddled planting or no plowing and we maintain some residues 15 percent and 40 percent residue so 50 percent crop residue we, we say this is our conventional method like farmers practices and 40 percent we ask them to uh, keep more residues in the field and we then evaluated from our previous experiment, then we tried to reduce 25% of nitrogen application, and then 100%, this is our national recommended dose, and we increase some 25% to see 
actually uh, the, the changes in nutrient requirement and then the effect on crop production and soil and greenhouse gas emissions. We measured uh, ammonia volatilization. We measured leaching loss from the field using the intact lysimeter. Uh, here is the sample of lysimeter sample for leaching loss. And this is our network for ammonia volatilization study. These guys are measuring ammonia volatilization. That is, the, this is one of the dominant nitrogen loss pathway in, in rice field. Okay. And we see uh, the result, irrespective of all factors, we see mean ammonia emission was 16% in both the years. We, we, we evaluated this in two years so to see is there any uh, seasonal differences or se seasonal changes, and it was uh, mostly 17 to 16 to 20%. And we see in con conventional TLS system, uh, the volatilization loss of nitrogen uh, range from 14 to 17%. But in strip tillage, this is only slightly higher, but not significant. Uh, but the message is that volatilization loss of nitrogen in the form of ammonia is a significant nitrogen loss pathway in rice field. That we, we thought it is only 5-6%, but from our measured data, we see this is up to 20%. We published this data in uh, Environmental Science Processes and Impacts. Maybe at some stage, if anybody is interested, we can share this. And then we did in rice rice system greenhouse gas emission, nitrous oxide emission here. And we see the linear uh, changes in nitrous oxide emission uh, based on the fertilizer rate. So the higher nitrogen fertilizer rate, the higher nitrous oxide emissions. And nitrous oxide emission, again, like wheat in rice field was same. It was significantly higher in conservation agriculture than uh, the conventional agriculture practices. Then we measured, we did not share here, uh, methane emission here. It followed the same fertilizer application, actually enhanced methane emission. Methane emission was higher in conventional agriculture practice than in co conservation agriculture practice. We found here, this is uh, actually, we need to clearly mention that nitrous oxide emission was higher in conservation agriculture practice, but methane emission was higher in conventional agriculture practice. And then if we compare the total global warming potential or the um, uh, business trade off of emission, we see conservation agriculture uh, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, total war reduces total warming potential by, by 16%, 16 to 39%. So even though nitrous oxide emission is higher in conservation, they reduces methane emission significantly and balancing the total emission must lower in conservation agriculture than in conventional agriculture practices. And again, another question, sometimes we neglect nitrous oxide emission in rice field. We say this is anaerobic system, this is underwater, so there is no nitrous oxide. But our measured data in repeatedly two years, they say it is more than 1% more than the IPCC default value. So what we are doing, we are uh, developing national greenhouse gas inventory uh, by sitting in front of desktop. And we say, okay, IPCC default value is saying this, and this is nitrous oxide emission. But our data is saying that, uh, are saying that this is wrong because our emission rate is much higher than the IPCC default value. Okay, and then nitrogen, we have also uh, published this data in, in, uh, in Frontiers in Environmental Science Journal recently. And another one, as I mentioned already, nutrient dynamics, fertilizer recommendations. So I have some data for sulfur, phosphorus, and potassium uh, dynamics, pools, and balance. And we compared this with conservation agriculture versus, versus the conventional management practices. And if you compare the total uh, productivity of crop of the field and annual productivity, conservation agriculture had much, not much, significantly higher uh, system productivity, total crop productivity in compared to the conventional management practices. And we um, tried to make a good balance of for sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen. We see if we follow conservation agriculture practice with higher crop residue retention, and we can use both higher sulfur rate and lower rate. And we see 
if we follow higher sulfur rate in conservation agriculture, we have more sulfur deposition in soil. But if we don't, don't follow conservation agriculture practices, then we have sulfur deficiency in the field. That means conservation agriculture can transform deficient nutrient content to uh, the surplus. That means it can make a positive balance. We have this data in soil and tillage research uh, we published in uh, last year. And this is our findings. Then we move for phosphorus and same result. Uh, we did it in, in Rastri region. We did in Maimenshing. We did in uh, Saline zone in Dakop, Khulna, and we did in Thakurgaon. And repeatedly, we co conducted this experiment for several years. And we this is the results is established that conservation agricultural practice where we reduce tillage, we increase crop residue rotation, rotation, it can make a positive balance of nutrients, it can reduce negative balance, it can enhance uh, total crop productivity, what we call system productivity. Okay, this is for balancing and now potassium, another one, we did it in Russia region. Same results that we found for phosphorus and sulfur for potassium, we have same results. If we follow conservation agriculture and we can increase about uh, 25 to 50 percent of potassium application because now potassium is decreasing in Bangladesh, especially nitrogen and potassium are deficient. So if we need to apply more potassium because of more potassium depletion from our soil, more potassium mining from the soil. So we need to apply more nitrogen and potassium, but less phosphorus and sulfur because of this uh, balance. Here, surprising result in without tillage, we can produce uh, more potato than tillage system in, in, in soil. This is one of the example of producing potato without tillage. We have this data in nutrient cycling in agroecosystem. We recently published it. And then I mentioned about the biochar. Uh, I think I don't need to go that detail for biochar. This is evening and I think this is very hard to concentrate in this kind of presentation. So uh, biochar actually it is anaerobically produced, anaerobically pyrolyzed organic matter that can in stabilize carbon in uh, uh, carbon content and which can sustain in soil maybe about 100 years. That is that means microbes cannot degrade them. And they, they can be used as a conditioner uh, for soil, improve soil um, nutrient holding capacity, improve uh, heavy metal uh, correction in soil, acidity correction in soil. So especially useful for sandy soil, especially useful for polluted soil, especially useful for um, acidic soil. So biosol can help uh, aluminum iron, to, uh, reduce aluminum iron manganese toxicity in acidic soil can help reduce cadmium, cobalt, and other heavy metal toxicity, and can re reduce soil compaction and increase soil porosity in sandy soil. Okay, an example of using biosol here, here if we, we use biosol and we reduce fertilizer application, but there is no reduction in yield. That means by using biosol, we can supplement chemical fertilizer. This example, biosol replication can significantly reduce uh, here if you follow uh, boro, ao, shanamon, three rice system. And this is uh, number C, this is bi biosol applied plot, biosol applied plot and biosol. We can see here significant reduction in ammonia volatilization lo loss in biosol uh, used plots. Okay, then another one we applied biosol with isotopic technique and same result again, biosol uh, applied plot increased cabbage yield and reduce ammonia volatilization loss. That means it has it had corresponding increase in nitrogen use efficiency. And then compost for IPNS, we have compost. This compost can actually, it can supplement chemical fertilizer and also can improve soil health. But we cannot use 100% compost for 100% um, reduction chemical fertilizer in the limited resources. We have to combine chemical fertilizer with some 20, 30, or 50% compost that can increase or sustain crop productivity, no reduction in productivity, no sacrifice in productivity, no compromise in productivity, but it at the same time, it can improve soil health. 
Okay, this is the, these are the some uh, organic matter that we can uh, use to produce compost. And then so I uh, explained it in details about the agroforestry system. So my main focus is on conservation agriculture practice, biosoil replication, compost application, integrated nutrient management using both organic and inorganic fertilizers that can enhance nutrient content in soil that can potentially reduce greenhouse gas emissions that can improve soil health like soil protein content, soil enzyme content, uh, soil biodiversity, microbial biomass carbon, and at the same time can increase crop production, can reduce uh, nutrient application, fertilizer application rate. These are some, some evidences from our experimental data in here in, in Bangladesh. I acknowledge uh, the contributors, our master's and PhD students, our colleagues from home and abroad. We, uh, we actually, we, are, we have been conducting this conservation agriculture research since 2012 with uh, Aust our Australian colleagues, uh, for this long term and we hope to continue this experiment even uh, for long term to see that uh, the changes in soil health over time the their impact on crop production and soil quality so thank you very much for uh, my too much talk too, too long talk if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer thank you thank you everybody for your attention Uh, hello, are you there? Nobody is there, maybe. Okay, sir. Thank you for a nice presentation. I think uh, we ourselves can moderate the session uh, about question, answer, and some comments or suggestion or discussion. Okay. And it, we welcome from our side. So floor is open for all. So I think no it questions. Uh, Dr. Chan, I guess there's a question in the comment chat box. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, oh, there is a question. Uh, I think the, these are the... I think he just introduced himself. Nothing else, no uh, question. In the, another question, I think, sir, there is an... Uh, question after the crops and land soil management irrigation conservation agriculture then these all things uh, may contribute to climate resilient agriculture how this can promote adaptation and climate smart agriculture so actually maybe we can answer this one sir can you contribute or uh, for all these things uh, about climate smart agriculture, how can contribute to climate smart agriculture? Is, this is the question here. Yeah? Yes, climate smart agriculture. Uh, okay, so the 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 basic concept of climate smart agriculture, uh, the agriculture system that can reduce chemical or fertilizer input, that can sustain soil health, that can sustain crop production, and uh, that can improve or that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is the main concept. So if we follow conservation agricultural practices, if we follow uh, organic amendment, uh, stabilized carbon, not uh, raw carbon, and then you can supplement some of the chemical fertilizer because if you reduce chemical fertilizer, it means you are uh, reducing fuel, use of fuel in uh, fertilizer industry. You, you are reducing use of fuel for transport. That means indirectly you are reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions because of your reducing fossil fuel combustion. And then this conservation agriculture, biosol, compost, and also some other uh, system as John mentioned, this all together can combinedly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, can improve soil quality, soil health, can in increase crop production. At the same time, they maintain the environmental condition, especially air and water quality. So I, I, I think this all together can contribute to uh, climate smart agriculture because uh, they're balancing production, soil health, and the environment. Okay, thank you, sir. So I hope Dr. Dijan Mollik from BCS, so uh, you got the answer or a discussion.
So if you have any uh, question, you can write in the chat box or you can uh, unmute yourself and can ask the question. So... Okay, I think uh, no question from uh, audience. Uh, however, we, you can uh, contact with us or we can you can uh, ask, uh, email us. We are, we are providing the email address. If you are interested to learn more about our discussed uh, matters and topics, it will be our pleasure to uh, provide you some suggestions or some uh, comments and we will incorporate we will try our best to reply you as soon as possible so however uh, it was a good uh, session i think i also enriched with uh, some information from our honorable uh, speaker and also with the audience those who have participated here and thanks to you all i think fatin uh, fate we can we have to conclude or we have need to Stop this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chan. Thank you, Mr. Jahangir. It was a really good session, and we got to learn a lot about the agriculture. And uh, of course, uh, it, it was really insightful. And uh, I guess before ending the session, it would be great if we could have a screenshot. Uh, yes. Okay, so can uh, you, everyone, can you please just turn on your camera yes. so that we can. May I ask uh, Jahangir sir, please, uh, Professor Jahangir sir, could you please stop the sharing, screen sharing, then it will be. Okay, I, I, yes. And... okay. okay. Great. So. Bring... Uh, Jahangir sir, do, do, would you mind uh, like turning on your camera? Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, it was a really insightful session. We learned a lot about the climate resilient agriculture. And uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you. Uh, I know it's been a, a late in Dhaka time, but thank you for joining. And uh, thank you for keeping like, uh, like staying here for a long time. And we, I'm just ending the recording here.